Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This video will part two of the Maelstrom Hunter. All credit goes to the author, Crimson QB Sage, for their amazing story. Make sure to read the whole story by clicking the link tree link in the description, then clicking on the name of this story. This part will be chapter three to four of the story. Also, don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now let's get into this amazing story. Signal Academy, 8.56 AM, Monday, Naruto's P.O.V. How the heck did I get back to this place? I thought I was done going to school after I graduated from Kanoha Academy. But here I am, all uniformed up, books in hand, and a small frown on my face. The uniform consisted of a white, short-sleeved, button-up shirt with the top two buttons unbuttoned, black pants with pockets on the sides, and black Venetian shoes. Again, how did I get into this mess? Flashback begins. Near Signal Academy, 11.35 AM, Clone Tins P.O.V. A sigh escaped my lips. I just had to be one of the smarter clones, not one of the many clones with such a short lifespan that they would only complete their tasks and then cease to exist. Oh well, can't dwell on that. I decided to complete my task as slowly as possible, just so I could have a longer life than most clones. Taking the time to reflect on the purpose of my existence and how it didn't fill the empty void feeling I had, I was in deep thought for a few hours, taking in the sights, sounds, and scents. Soon enough, around noon, I stumbled across a cluster of tannish buildings that were connected by one of those gray stone paths. Only these paths looked newer and didn't have cracks in them. These paths were besieged by areas covered in green grass. A few small trees lie near the path here and there. In front of me, to my right, was a large stone of the same color as the buildings with an inscription. It said, Welcome to Signal Academy, training the hunters and huntresses of tomorrow. Hunters? Huntresses? I was not familiar with the term so my curiosity was piqued. Hey you! I heard from behind me. I turned my head to see a large, burly man with pale skin and brown hair approaching me. His demeanor consisted of a blue button-up shirt along with navy blue pants. He had a shining metal item attached above his chest and a black item, which I had guessed was a radio, attached to his left shoulder. If I had to guess, he was probably a guard of some kind. Me? I asked, not knowing where this was headed. Yes, you. What the heck are you doing out of class? The man exclaimed. Uh, I started, confused by his statement. Never mind, you're coming with me to the principal's office. He cut me off, grabbing me by the arm and pulling me in what was most likely the direction of the principal's office. So, from what I have figured out, this is a school campus, and this man, who is most likely a security guard, is pulling me to the school's principal's office to most likely receive punishment. Cammy, why couldn't I be one of the less troublesome clones? Soon enough. We arrived at the school's principal's office. The man who had dragged me here opened the door. Inside the room was quite simple. The walls were a light shade of gray, there was a filing cabinet in both corners of the room, and in the center, a desk made of oak wood rested, the surface covered by stacks of paper, though none the size of what the Hokage had to deal with, a few pins, and a nameplate in the front center of the desk. Mr. Brown, the security guard started, addressing the man who stood behind the desk. I caught this young hoodlum trying to skip class. Well, Mr. Brown, a middle-aged, slightly balding man with glasses, said, We won't have any of that. What's the student's name? Erm, well, the security guard started. I didn't exactly get the name of this student. What's your name? Even in these circumstances, I gave the man a deadpan look. Naruto Uzumaki, I said, seeing as their surname goes after their born name. Ah, uh, well, Mr. Uzumaki, I haven't heard of you being at this school before. I panicked a bit hoping that they wouldn't find out I wasn't really part of this school. Suddenly, I got an idea. I'm new here, I said, sweating slightly. A small silence graced the room as I awaited my fate. Well, that explains why, Mr. Brown said. But that still doesn't explain why you were skipping your classes, the security guard said. I kinda lost my schedule, I lied. Oh, the security guard said, embarrassed a bit. Now, Harold, the newly named Harold the security guard straightened up a bit. Go back to what you were doing, and this time, before you bring people to my office, make sure you get their identity first. Harold nodded his head and left the room. Mr. Brown had a smile on his face before Harold left the room. After he left, his smile turned into a slight frown. Now, Mr. Uzumaki, he started, his voice turning more serious. I don't like it when people lie to me right in front of my face. So tell me exactly who you are. I stared at the man in surprise. He had been able to see right through my lie. How did you know I was lying? I asked. Mr. Uzumaki, I've dealt with a lot of students over the years. 
I learned to tell when students lie or not. Well, my name really is Naruto Uzumaki. I'm sort of a runaway, I said. I left my homeland because of certain circumstances that I'm not willing to say. Hmm, so you've run away from home? Where exactly is your home? He asked. Do you have a map? I asked. He nodded his head and brought out a map the size of half the desk. The map itself was simple enough. It had a light brown color, highlighting the land masses in black. For castle-like icons stood out on the map, most likely indicating areas of civilization. I dragged my finger across the map until it hit the landmass near the bottom center area. Mr. Brown looked surprised at that. Here, I said. Mr. Brown looked between me and the area of the map I had pointed to. There? He asked, unsure about my answer. Yes, I came from a land known by the name of the Elemental Nations, I answered. And you're sure of this? Yes, I lived in an area known as the Elemental Nations. After that, we talked about the Elemental Nations. He asked me about my homeland and I asked him about this place. I briefly explained about Chakra and how it worked, and that I was hiding from people who wanted to use me as a weapon. Soon enough, he helped me create a false identity and enrolled me into his school, Signal Academy. I got my class schedule and thanked him for his help, and that was the end of my lifespan. I closed my eyes, accepting my fate, and then everything was black, followed by a blinding white. Flashback end. Signal Academy, 8.59 a.m. Naruto's P.O.V. Students passed by me, wrapped up in their own conversations. I was caught up in my own thoughts when I heard a giggling noise come from behind me. I turned my head to see a group of girls giggling and blushing at me. Oh Kami no, not the fangirls. I saw what Sasuke had to go through with them. I almost felt pity for him. Now, I'm just sympathetic towards him, which is a first. Cuckoo cuckoo cuckoo. I felt a shiver go down my spine as one of the girls laughed creepily, joined by the other girls. Fearing for my life, I used this secret technique, run from the fangirls no jutsu, a technique I had seen Sasuke team, Kakashi, and Karasuanbu use many times before. Quickly escaping the sight of the fangirls, I weaved in and out of crowds until I got to a corner and faster than lightning hid behind it. Using my awesome shinobi powers, I sensed around the corner. I comically poked my head around the corner and looked left and right. Seeing as I wasn't being followed, I sighed in relief. I escaped the horrors known as fangirls. For now, I heard the QB say. That wasn't very reassuring, but then again, it's the QB's job to screw with me psychologically. Ignoring the QB, I took a look at my new surroundings. Great, just great. Lost before the first day has even begun. You look lost, you need any help? I heard a feminine voice from behind me. I turned my head to see a girl around my age behind me. She was wearing the girl's school uniform, which consisted of a dark red plaid skirt, a white, short-sleeved button-up shirt, and black flat shoes. She had black hair with red streaks, and two silver eyes that had a slight gleam in them. Yeah, I'm new to the school, and I may have gotten lost, I said, stretching out the last part. I can show you to your classes, she said. By the way, I'm Ruby. Nice to meet you. Name's Naruto, the number one hyperactive knucklehead ninja, I said, puffing out my chest in pride. But I thought ninjas were supposed to be stealthy. You didn't look so stealthy back there, my chest along with a bit of my pride, deflated at that. You saw that? I asked. She just giggled a bit. Maybe, she said, a small smirk plastered on her face. So, can you help me find my class? I asked, changing the subject off of my shenanigans. Sure, where are you headed to? I looked down at the paper that held my schedule. It said my first class was with someone by the name of Crow. What kind of a name was that? It says I have my first class with some guy by the name of Crow? I said, hopefully pronouncing his name right. Oh, you got my uncle for your first class, she exclaimed cheerfully. Sweet. Databeo? I exclaimed. Databeo? She curiously asked. Sorry, it's a verbal tick, I said, looking away slightly out of embarrassment. We have to get to classes before we're late, she exclaimed, looking at the time. After receiving directions from Ruby to Crow's class, I ran to the place so that I wouldn't be late. While running to class, I ran into someone, and both of us went down. Sorry about that, I said. I looked at who I ran into, and found the person who I had collided with. I didn't get a good look at who I ran into, but I could tell that the person I ran into was female. She had slightly more tan skin compared to mine, and spiky mint green hair. Crap. Sorry about running into you, but I've got to get to class, I exclaimed, running towards class as I waved goodbye before she could answer. Finally, after running to the classroom, I found Professor Crow's room. 
Opening the door, I entered to see that my tardiness had gone unnoticed. Thankfully, other students talked with their friends, all excited for the first day. The room itself was larger than expected. The seats were leveled so that an arc was formed around the center, and each level was slightly more elevated than the last. In the center of the room, in front of a green chalkboard, was a tall man. He had black hair with patches of gray hair visibly present, dark gray eyes that held years of experience and knowledge, and he wore black pants and a gray suit. All right, class, he started. Take your seats. I'm Professor Crow. Welcome to Weapons 101. Seven hours later, classes were over once that final bell rang. I left the classroom with a speed that would put the Hyrushin, flying thunder god, to shame. Groups of people moved together, chatting with one another about classes and their lives. I was walking down the path, minding my own business when I heard someone call out my name. Hey Naruto. I heard from my left. I turned my head to the source of the voice to see Ruby and another girl standing with her. The other girl had long, wavy blonde hair that accented her royal purple eyes. Along with the school uniform which was mandatory, she had on black fingerless gloves and yellow metallic bracelets. Hiya Ruby. I called back. I moved over to where the duo was standing and started up a conversation. So how was your first day at Signal? Ruby asked. Pretty good. I said, a bit hectic though. So who's tall, blonde, and foxy here, sis? The blonde girl standing next to Ruby asked. Oh yeah. Naruto, this is my sister Yang Yang. This is Naruto, Ruby replied. Nice to meet you, I said, smiling a bit. Likewise, Yang replied, also smiling. The three of us talked for a bit after introductions were out of the way, but eventually, we all said our goodbyes and parted ways. Soon after they left though, I noticed another familiar face. The girl I had run into earlier was talking with two other guys. The one to her left stood around six feet tall or so, had dark brown spiked hair and light brown eyes, and strangely enough, a white horse tail. The other guy to their right was at least a foot shorter than that horse guy, he had red shaggy hair along with a small beard. His eyes were charcoal black, and like the taller guy, he too had a tail, except his resembled that of a monkey's tail. Before I could say anything to them though, they had already left. I shrugged my shoulders. I would probably run into them later on. Heading off the school campus, I ventured the city in search of easy pickpockets and shops. Naruto's base, 8.23 p.m. Naruto's P.O.V. Today was exciting, I thought to myself. It was really surprising at how easy it is to pickpocket people in this city and get away with it. And after borrowing some money and some other stuff, I bought some dinner and materials for making myself a weapon, using the shops that Professor Crow recommended for our first project, creating our own weapon. No, it wasn't, the QB said. There's nothing fun around here. You just had to, didn't you? I mentally deadpanned. Had to what? The QB asked. Cutting the mental connection I had with the QB, I entered the warehouse I was staying in. As I entered, I heard the sound of talking come from inside. Preparing myself, I pulled out a hidden kanai I had hidden in my pants. Crouching down, I peeked around the corner to see who was in my base of operations. Luckily, I had hidden the scroll of seals in one of the storage units. There were at least ten people in front of me. They all wore black suits with red shades and black fedoras. Seven of them had red katanas in their hand whilst the other three had hand cannons, or pistols as they're called, in their hands. Forming ten Kage Bunshins, the clones snuck behind the armed people. Nodding my head, I signaled the clones to strike as they each knocked out their targets. After all the targets were knocked out, I mentally ordered the clones to tie them up near the nearest police station. After the last of the clones exited with the unconscious men, I took it upon myself to investigate why they were here in the first place. In the center of the room, there were several large dark gray crates. Curiosity got the better of me as I moved closer to one of the crates and opened it up. Standing back and covering my face in case it was an explosive, I braced myself. After a few seconds, and not exploding, I peeked past my defenses to see what was in the crate. It wasn't explosives, nor was it drugs. Instead, the crate was loaded with these odd glowing crystals of varying colors. I think they're called dust crystals, if what Mr. Brown told me is correct. And if they're as useful as he says, then I just struck the motherload. It was then and there that I calmly reacted to this bountiful collection of dust that I had acquired by jumping around in joy and frothing slightly from the mouth. It certainly was a good day to be me. Ahem, I heard from behind me. I turned my head to see a man in a red-collared white suit, a gray scarf, black gloves with rounded sleeves, and a black bowler hat with a red band. What was noticeable was his bright orange hair and dark green eyes, and a cane-shaped object in his hand. Do you mind? 
I stated slightly pissed off, you're ruining a perfect moment here. Yes, I do believe that those crystals are mine, though, the man stated, in an overly polite tone with a hint of anger. And, I stated, not caring about what he said. The man looked at me slightly pissed. And they should be returned to their rightful owner, me. I narrowed my eyes. Where have I seen this guy before? Wait a minute. Hey, I recognize you. You're that criminal guy on TV that wears the eyeliner. I exclaimed, pointing accusingly at him. The man's left eye twitched slightly, but he still kept his composure. Yes, yes I am. Now give me the dust, blonde, he said. Why should I? I asked dryly. Well, um. His mouth opened to give an explanation, but no words came out. After a minute, he finally shrugged his shoulders and slumped in defeat. I got nothing, he finally said. Just give me the damn dust. Then he pointed his cane at me, revealing a hollowed out hole at the bottom of it, most likely to shoot something. Face it, blonde. I have the advantage in this battle, he said with a smirk. I formed an all too familiar cross shaped hand sign. Oh, really? I said, giving a smirk of my own and forming a dozen Kaga bunchins. I beg to differ. His expression shifted to a mixture of confusion, surprise, and panic, seeing as he was outnumbered and caught by surprise. He lowered his cane cannon and put his hands up in mock defeat. Okay, that I didn't expect. Take me away, Mr. Fuzz, he said mockingly, extending his hands out like he was being cuffed. You have ten seconds to leave, I said. I'd take that offer, if I were you. He casually strode out of the room, as if I wasn't very threatening. Before he left, he turned to me. I won't forget this, he said, a scowl on his face. Next time, you'll regret messing with me. Whatever you say, Flaky, that got another eye twitch out of him. And with that, he left, making sure that he was gone. I went to the cargo box where I hid the scroll of seals to see if it was still there. Thankfully, it was. Grabbing it, I unraveled it and activated the Uzumaki blood scroll. And in a puff of smoke, Haranjiji appeared. After taking in the new surroundings, he turned to speak to me. Looks like you found yourself a neat little hideout, he said. As my left eye twitched, he started smirking. I like to call it my hidden base of operations, I stated, sticking my tongue out in a childlike manner at the end. His smirk got bigger at that, before his expression turned serious. Getting into a fighting stance, he spoke to me. Now, let's start working on your training, shall we, he said. After speaking, he charged at me, not even giving me time to get into a fighting stance. Unknown location. Third person P. Dotto dot v. And you're sure of this? A male voice said. I'm positive, a female voice replied. Didn't you feel it as well? I can't say I didn't, a third voice replied, also male. But if he's here, do you think dash? Most likely, the first voice replied. But I think we'll be hidden for two, three years at the most before we encounter others. The three mysterious figures stayed silent after that, digesting the new information. They had expected this for a while now but had secretly hoped that they wouldn't be found out. Does he know? The first voice asked, finally breaking the silence that permeated the air. I don't think it's likely, the second voice answered, but he'll eventually find out. And when he does, then what? The third voice asked. Then that's when we'll confront him, the second voice replied. Silence once again filled the air as the trio stood silent, waiting for someone to break the silence. And eventually, the third voice spoke up. I still think we should confront him now the third voice stated, uneasy with the current plan. It'll be better if he figures it out on his own. That way, should he be caught, our secret will be safe, the second voice said. Fine, the third voice finally conceded. The trio stared at one another, as if already knowing what the other was going to say. 500 Rio on it taking him one year, the first voice said. You're on. I'll place 500 on two, the third voice challenged. Humph, idiots. The second voice, the only female present, said before smirking, 500 on 3. You're gonna make me rich, the first voice said. A smirk could be made out in the shadows. As if, you'll be weeping when I clean you out, the third voice countered. Boys please, you'll both be weeping when I win, the female said, having the largest smirk of the trio. Three years later, third P. Dotto dot v. Legends, a female voice started. Stories scattered through time. Mankind has grown quite fond of recounting the exploits of heroes and villains, forgetting so easily that we are remnants, byproducts, of a forgotten past. The gems in the image glow green and fade to show simple pictures of a man rising from the earth before being surrounded by creatures, barely held back by warriors. Man, born from dust, was strong, wise, and resourceful. 
but he was born into an unforgiving world. An inevitable darkness, creatures of destruction, the creatures of Grimm, set their sights on man and all of his creations. These forces clashed, and it seemed the darkness was intent on returning man's brief existence to the void. Black sets in, then suddenly lessens as a light grows brighter and brighter until a gem rises from it and lowers itself into the hands of man. However, even the smallest spark of hope is enough to ignite change, and in time, man's passion, resourcefulness, and ingenuity led them to the tools that would help even the odds. This power was appropriately named Dust. The scene zooms out to show men shooting lightning, raising swords, and aiming rifles at the retreating beasts as a castle appears behind them. Nature's wrath in hand. Man lit their way through the darkness, and in the shadow's absence came strength, civilization, and most importantly, life. The castle zooms out to show the world map, which houses other buildings until they disappear in flashes of white, and the map is lowered to show the scattering moon over a city at night. But even the most brilliant lights eventually flicker and die, and when they are gone, darkness will return. Roman Torchwick and fourteen of his henchmen head down an alley from the shadows. They stop behind Roman, who reignited his cigar without touching it and grins before walking down the road, frightening nearby citizens as they make their way towards the shop from dusk till dawn. So you may prepare your guardians, build your monuments to a so-called free world. But take heed, there will be no victory in strength. Roman and his henchmen enter the store, approaching the shopkeeper. But perhaps victory is in the simpler things that you've long forgotten. A different, more masculine voice says. The image turns black, revealing nothing but a pair of two fireballs, one blue and one red. The two fireballs combine in a counterclockwise direction, forming a pair of dark purple eyes with four concentric rings fanning out from the pupil across the scara of both eyes. Things that require a smaller, more honest soul. A third voice finishes. The two eyes suddenly collided with each other, forming one eye. As soon as the two eyes become one, the eye changes from dark purple with four rings to crimson red, still retaining its four rings, only difference being that all of the rings except the furthest from the pupil had three tomo, making a total of nine tomo in the eye. Near from dusk till dawn. Naruto's P.O.V. Here I was, walking to a store called From Dust Till Dawn, reading the book I had gotten from Deterem no Sato, The Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi, which was an interesting read considering Jiraiya's books were mainly smut. Thinking about the perverted hermit made me think on what's happened in the last three years. Wow, time really flies. These last three years went by so fast, and with so much progress. I mean seriously, it felt as if some guy was typing words into a computer, got lazy, and decided to skip over some sort of canon timeline. Whatever the heck that means, meh, it's partially true backslash backslash circumflexed, circumflex forward slash. Shaking the thought aside, I decided for some random reason to stroll down memory lane. Well, let's see here, QB attack on Kanoha, check. Crappy 12 years, check. Betrayed by my supposed best friend. Check. Struck a deal with the devil. Check. Got a new look. Check. Became a student. Check. Built an awesome weapon. Definite check. Learn new awesome jutsus. Double check. I changed over the years, no longer standing at 5 feet 11 inches, now standing at 6 feet 1 inch. My once spiky golden blonde hair has grown out more and now with jaw length bangs, just like my father had. All in all, I looked more like my father would. If he had whisker marks, and fox ears and tail. I was wearing something similar to what Unbo and Satsu Senjutsu Takushu Butai, Special Assassination and Tactical Squad, wore, minus the mask. I wore a sleeveless turtleneck black shirt, black fingerless gloves with metal plates that had the Uzumaki symbol etched in them, black pants with bandages wrapped around the right thigh, black ninja sandals, a gray flak jacket with the Uzumaki symbol in a dark orange on the back. And to top it all off, I had a pair of goggles similar to my old ones on top of my head except the cloth was a dark red. My body had no baby fat left, all of it being molded into muscle from Harinjiji's training. Along with my increase in physical strength, my training in Fuenjutsu, Ninjutsu, Taijutsu, and Kenjutsu had exponentially increased. My Jinjutsu was still crap, but it had gotten better. I've discovered that I can use Jinjutsu, but I can't cast it without Fuenjutsu seals because of my massive chakra reserves. I also learned of my chakra affinity. The first time I sent chakra through one of those chakra papers, I got some interesting results. The paper split in half with one sharp, clean cut. One of the halves turned into pure water, and the other half spontaneously combusted. From what Harinjiji told me, my chakra affinities were futon, wind release, suetun, water release, and katan, fire release. 
the futon from my father, the suite un from my mother, and the katan from, strangely enough, the QB. After learning of my affinities, I learned a multitude of awesome jutsus from the scrolls I had on me, Kami Bless Kaga Bunshins, Shadow Clones, and with the help of Harenjiji and Kro Sensei, along with the dust crystals that I had acquired, I was able to make two weapons, both very unique. Strapped to my back was a near-perfect version of an also-familiar blade that I had seen only once before. From the mission to Wave Country, I had made a near-replica of Kubikiri Bocho, decapitating carving knife, but unlike the original, it has a few more add-ons. Spending over six months forging this blade alone, but it was worth it. After all, combining chakra metal, dust crystals, and titanium I had acquired isn't exactly an easy task. The blade itself was at least seven feet in length, handle, and blade together, and had an orange line running through the sword and the edges of the circle at the top. The blade didn't have the regenerative ability of the original, but Harenjiji had engraved regenerative seals that only required chakra to use, added with the fact that it could control the elements of dust, it certainly was a magnificent sword. Strapped to the left of my waist was a tanto, short blade, that was made of a fusion of chakra metal and titanium. And finally, I had two gun holsters, each on one side of my waist, and each held an onyx black .45 fletcher with an orange line running along both sides of the guns. It was made from a chakra metal and titanium mix that made it so instead of using regular bullets, I could shoot out shots of condensed chakra, saving lead bullets and magazines. And ever since my changes, Yang had begun flirting with me much like Ankonizen would, and Ruby had this constant blush on her face, much like Hinata used to. Maybe she had a fever. Speaking of people from Kanoha, every now and then I get letters from Aero Sinin via Gamakichi or Gamatatsu, the last one I got stating that they finally added Tsunade Bachan's face to the side of the Hokage Mountain. Of course, I send letters back. Though I try to keep my location hidden, I have told him that I'm safely beyond the Okino Okinote, Ocean of Mystery. I was shaken from my musings when I heard the sound of glass breaking. Looking up from my book in a Kakashi-like manner, I saw a red blur crash through the window of From Dust till Dawn tackling a man dressed in a black suit with red-tinted shades, getting a better look at the red blur. I saw the person turned out to be female. She stood at 5 feet 10 inches, with a pale complexion, silver eyes, and black hair with red streaks. She was wearing a black outfit and skirt along with a red hood. And in her hands was an all-too-familiar red sniper scythe, crescent rose. Hiya, Ruby. I yelled out to her. She turned to look at me and blushed a bit. Did she have a fever again? Hi, Naruto. She yelled back. We were about to go into one of our usual conversations until we heard someone clear their throat to get our attention. Standing in the area where Ruby crashed through the shop window was Roman Torchwick, surrounded by several of his lackeys. A cigar was in his mouth, and his cane cannon was in his right hand. Flaky! I exclaimed cheerfully, successfully making his left eye twitch. How you doing? Okay. He started, get them, especially the blonde. Half of his lackeys charged at me, while the other half attacked Ruby. Seeing as there were only seven charging at me, I brought out two of my items. In my right hand was the gun from my right holster, and in my left hand, I held the tail of the utterly gutsy shinobi, open to the page I had left off on. Thinking that they had the upper hand, two of the lackeys charged at me. Not even looking up from my book, I shot out two bullets of condensed chakra, both hitting their desired targets. Seeing as there were still five left, I quickly disposed of them with five more bullets, instantly killing them. I looked up to see how Ruby was faring and saw that she had taken out her enemies as well. Off to the side, climbing up a nearby ladder, Roman was escaping. Grinning, I took off after him, Ruby not that far behind me. We climbed up the ladder, following the path that Roman took in his escape. On top of the roof of the building, I knew that he had some kind of escape plan. He wouldn't have made it this far in his villainous career if he got caught easily. As I prepared myself for what could happen, I heard a rumbling sound come from where Roman was. Persistent, he said as a getaway bullhead rose up and opened its hatch to allow Roman inside. End of the line, red, blondie, he exclaimed smugly, throwing a red dust crystal at Ruby and aiming his cane cannon in our direction. Just as the blast from the cane cannon was about to impact, a blonde woman jumped in the way, holding a wand of sorts waving it once in the air. A giant purple crystal seal of sorts appeared, blocking the shot from Roman's cane. After the smoke from the impact dissipated, I saw that the woman was wearing a female business suit and a purple cape, rectangular glasses, and had emerald green eyes, waving her wand-like object once again, this time causing the purple crystals to form into several streaks that shot out at the bullhead, 
causing the pilot to struggle with controlling the aircraft. She then shot out a purple ball of energy which caused storm clouds to form and rain down light blue crystals on the ship. Standing in the area that Roman once stood on the ship was a woman in red with black hair and orange eyes. The mysterious woman formed a fireball in her hand and shot it at the blonde woman, causing her to form a purple protective barrier around herself. The mysterious woman then formed a fire pillar underneath the woman she was attacking causing the female blonde to jump away before it struck. The blonde woman then formed a crystal arrow and shot it at the bullhead. The mystery woman kept firing fireballs at the crystal projectile, but it kept reforming. The bullhead shifted down leftward, causing the arrow to bounce off the side of the aircraft, forming three streaks to attack the ship again. The mystery woman shot out a fire pulse of some kind, destroying the crystals. Ruby shifted her crescent rose from a scythe into its sniper mode and shot at the mystery woman. Wanting to do my part, I grabbed the two guns I had on my person and shot at the woman as well. All of the shots were deflected by the woman's fire powers. Eventually, she formed five fire pillars underneath our feet. I felt my body being pulled by some unknown force, narrowly evading the fire attacks. We watched as the ship flew away. I growled, knowing that Roman got away this time. You're a huntress, I heard Ruby say to the blonde woman. Can I have your autograph? The Dark Room of Shame Naruto's P.O.V. I hope you realize that your actions tonight will not be taken lightly, you two. You both put yourselves and others in great danger, the blonde woman, now known to be Glinda, said. Well, to be fair, they started it, I said. If it were up to me, you'd be sent home. With a pat on the back? She started. I noticed Ruby started to smile. And a slap on the wrist. That last part she emphasized by swinging her wand at Ruby, who let out a small eek. But, she started. There's someone here who would like to meet both of you. As soon as she finishes saying that, she moves out of the way to reveal a man with gray hair, shaded spectacles, a dark green scarf with a small purple cross-shaped emblem on it, an unzipped black suit, and brown eyes. In his hands, he held a mug and a plate of cookies with a ramen bowl. Ruby Rose, the man starts, leaning in a bit as he continued talking. You have silver eyes. Ooh, um. Ruby started trying to come up with words. And you, he said, directed at me, Naruto Uzumaki, I didn't believe what your file said, but apparently it's true that you have whisker marks. And, I asked, so, where did you learn to do this? He asked, gesturing to a screen that recorded our fight with Roman. Signal Academy, Ruby replies. They taught you to use one of the most dangerous weapons ever designed. He stated more than asked. I'm more self-taught, I said. Well, one teacher in particular. Ruby says. I see. The man said, placing down the plate with cookies and the bowl of ramen. While Ruby tentatively picks up one of the cookies and starts to eat them, faster than lightning, the bowl of ramen was in my hands, and I was slurping away at the food of the gods. It's just that I've only seen one other scythe wielder of that skill before. A dusty, old crow? The man states, after recovering from the surprise of the speed that I ate ramen. Mm, that's my uncle. Ruby says with a mouthful of cookies. She swallows and wipes her mouth. Embarrassingly, she continues, Sorry, that's my Uncle Crow. He's a teacher at Signal. I was complete garbage before he took me under his wing. And now I'm all like, Hawawa. Witcha. That last part she finished by making karate-style poses and noises. And what about you? He asked me. Lots and lots of trial and error. A few times that one of my things blew up on me. Eventually, I got it down. I said, acting nonchalant. To the point that you can shoot without having to look at your targets? He asked. Yep, I said, popping out the P in the word. And what are you two doing at a school designed to train warriors? I'm going to be a hunter, I said. Well, I want to be a huntress, Ruby replied. You want to slay monsters? The man asked. Yeah, I only have two more years of training left at Signal. And then I'm going to apply to Beacon, she exclaimed excitedly, talking faster and faster. You see, my sister's starting there this year and she's trying to become a huntress, and I'm trying to become a huntress because I want to help people. My parents always taught us to help others, so I thought, hey, I might as well make a career out of it. I mean, the police are alright, but huntsmen and huntresses are just so much more romantic and exciting and cool and really, gosh, you know? That was followed by a small pause, the man and Glinda analyzing us. After a few seconds, the man spoke again. Do you know who I am? He asked. You're Professor Oshbin. You're the headmaster at Beacon. Ruby said. The now identified Ashbin smiled. Hello, he said. Nice to meet you, Ruby said. Yo, 
I replied lazily, waving in a Kakashi-like manner. You two want to come to my school? He asked. More than anything, Ruby said. Sure, sounds exciting, I replied. After exchanging glances with Glinda, who showed a disapproving look, followed by a humph, Ashbin turned back to us. Well, okay, he said. I looked wide-eyed, while Ruby looked like she had just hit the jackpot. Aboard the airship to Beacon, Naruto's P.O.V. Ergurk, I said. Kami, I would never get used to these flying vehicles. It was one thing to fly with Chakra, it was another to trust someone else with flying you around in a big thing of metal. Bwahahaha. I heard the QB laugh at my misery. Oh shut up, furball, I mentally said. At least you aren't the only one who's suffering, it pointed out. I saw a blonde, shaggy-haired man who looked like he wasn't an experienced warrior throw up on Yang's shoes. Gross, 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 I heard Yang exclaim. Get away, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me, Ruby exclaimed shortly after Yang's statement. I looked out the ship's window, smiling to myself. Look out Beacon, the number one hyperactive knucklehead ninja is coming your way. I mentally exclaimed, before my motion sickness kicked in again. Ergurg, I said, comically falling over with steam coming from my mouth. Kanoha Council Room, 3rd P.O.V. Now that we're all here, let us begin the meeting, one Danzo Shimura said. I'd like to know what this meeting is about, Inoichi Yamanaka stated. I would like to know that as well said Shikakanara. It's about the QB brat, Danzo replied. As soon as the words came out of his mouth, the insufferable civilian side of the council went into one of their self-induced fits of rage. After a minute of their justifiable complaints, the Hokage shut them up. Shut up! Tsunade exclaimed, thoroughly pissed off. As I was saying, Danzo continued, I think it's time for Kanoha to get its Jinchuriki back. Beacon Academy entrance, 10 a.m., Naruto's P.O.V. Soon enough, the ship docked at the entrance. The blonde guy that threw up on Yang's shoes was the first off of the ship, followed by nearly everyone else. From the view of the floor, even with the puffs of smoke coming from my mouth, I could see Yang and Ruby standing over me. Ergurg. I groaned out. The two sisters giggled and Yang brought out a camera seemingly from nowhere. Taking a photo of my misery, the two eventually helped me out of the flying metal death trap after a minute of laughing. We were walking away from the ship and towards Beacon. I crossed my arms and pouted in a childlike manner, seeing as Ruby and Yang were still laughing. It's not that funny, I said. This only served to increase their laughter. Yes, it is, Yang replied. And now I have dirt on you. I saw her smirk and countered it with my own, seeing as she wasn't the only one with blackmail. Did you forget that I still have pictures from that, I said, her expression instantly turning from amusement to horror. You said that you got rid of all those photos, she said, slightly quivering in fear. I still have a few here and there, I countered, my smirk growing wider as I spoke. You wouldn't, she tried to reason. Try me, I said. The world seemed to go silent as we got into one of our daily stare downs to see which of us would back down first. So far the score was Naruto, 561, Yang, 356. Soon enough, Yang backed down and I tallied 562 to my score. Wow, I hear Ruby say as we got closer to Beacon Academy. The view from Vale's got nothing on this, Yang said. I'll say, I added. I see Ruby start to eye weapons like a kid in a candy shop, and soon, she is launched after them. Her sister Yang not so far behind her to make sure she doesn't go crazy. I sighed. Even here, Ruby is still a weapon enthusiast. I looked around, looking for other familiar faces, when I saw a familiar trio that I encountered in Signal, only this time, they weren't wearing school uniforms. To the left was the red-haired kid with the monkey tail, only he was wearing something similar to what I saw Shinobi from a Wagakure wear. A one-strap flak jacket, a shirt with one long sleeve with the other short, and baggy pants. Attached to his sides were two revolvers with extended blades, FF revolvers. To the right was the really tall guy who had a horse tail, not much had changed besides him wearing a face mask. He wore red samurai armor along with a red straw hat, and strapped to his back was a large double-edged axe shotgun, and in the middle was the girl with mint hair. It appeared she also had orange eyes. She was wearing a white shirt that showed off her belly button, along with a white skirt. She had some weird-looking tunfas at her side. The trio seemed to notice me as the girl in the middle waved at me. I waved back and was about to head over to them when suddenly I heard something from behind me. Kaboom! I turned around just in time to see an explosion of flames, snowflakes, 
and electricity. Also, in time to have the front of my face turn into one of those blackened cartoonish faces. I blinked once, twice, three times. What just happened? Deciding not to think about it. I saw that the girl in white who was at the center of the explosion was walking away, and the blonde guy who threw up on the ship was helping Ruby up. I went over to the duo after the blonde guy helped Ruby up. What was that explosion? I asked Ruby. She blushed out of embarrassment before replying. I sorta exploded, she said. Hey, I'm John, the other blonde said. Naruto, I replied, shaking the hand extended to me by him. On Beacon Academy campus, 10.25 a.m., Naruto's P.O.V. All I'm saying is that motion sickness is a much more common problem than people let on, John said. Look, I'm sorry. Vomit Boy was the first thing that came to mind, Ruby giggled. I myself was also chuckling. Oh yeah? What if I called you Crater Face? Or Whiskers? John countered, the last nickname directed at me. I just shrugged my shoulders. Hey, that explosion was an accident. Ruby cried. Meh, I've heard worse, I said. Well, the name's John Ark. Short, sweet, rolls off the tongue. Ladies love it, John said. Really? I asked. Do they? Ruby asked as well, a bit skeptical. They will. Well, I hope they will. My mom always says that. Never mind, John replied. Trust me, dude, it won't work, I told him. So, I got this thing. Ruby says after a short silence, pulling out crescent rose and stabbing it into the ground. Whoa, is that a scythe? John asked. It's also a customizable high-impact sniper rifle, Ruby said proudly. A wa? John asked, thoroughly confused. It's also a gun, she explained. So, what V you got? Ruby asked John. Oh, I, uh... John fumbled, pulling out the blade at his side. I got this sword. Uhu. Ruby says in fascination. Yeah, and I've got this shield too, John says, grabbing his scabbard as it transformed into a shield. So, what do they do? Ruby asked. The shield gets smaller, so when I get tired of carrying it, I can just put it away? John says, transforming his shield back into a scabbard and placing it back at his side. But, wouldn't it weigh the same? Ruby questions. Yeah, it does. John says dejectedly, So what about you, Naruto? Well, I got these, I said, referring to the two pistols holstered on my side. I pulled one out to examine. They don't use regular bullets, I said, aiming the gun at seemingly nothing. They run on condensed energy that is shot out with a speed equivalent to that of, if not greater than a regular bullet would be. Mm. John said, confused. It shoots energy, I stated simply. Putting the gun back in its holster, I grabbed the tanto on my side from its sheath and held the blade out for examination. This here is my tanto. It's meant for close combat, and I can channel elements through it, I explained. After that, I sheathed the short blade and grabbed the cleaver from my back. And this, this is my greatest creation, I said, hoisting the blade onto my shoulder. It's meant for brute force. Like my tanto, I can also channel the elements through this, and the little extra. What do you mean by that? John asked. That's. Both John and Ruby leaned in to hear what I had to say. A secret. Both face faulted at that, causing me to give them the patented Kakashi eye smile. So, Ruby starts, having gotten over her face fault. Did you forge them yourself? Of course, I replied. Wait, you made these? John exclaimed in disbelief. All students at Signal make their own weapons. Didn't you make yours? Ruby asked. It's a hand-me-down. My great-great-grandfather used it to fight in the war, John said. Sounds more like a family heirloom to me. Well, I like it. Not many people have an appreciation for the classics these days, Ruby said. Yeah, the classics, John said, sheathing his sword. We started walking again, not really knowing where we were headed. So why'd you help me out back there? In the courtyard? Ruby asked John. Yeah, why not? My mom always says, strangers are just friends you haven't met yet, John replies. Hey, where are we going? Ruby asks, realizing we were lost. Mm. I don't know, I replied. I was following you guys, John adds. You think there might be a directory? Maybe a food court? Some kind of recognizable landmark? Is, uh, is that a no? That's a no, Ruby says, slightly laughing. Nope, I said, popping the P. Kanoha Mission Room, 3rd P.O.V. Back in Kanoha, Three years had passed since the number one hyperactive knucklehead ninja was exiled. His exile had lasted only two years, 
and Naruto was expected to return to Konoha and be reinstated as a shinobi. Only one problem with that. He didn't return as expected, but they waited and waited and waited, but to no avail, as he had not returned. It hadn't affected the civilian side of the council, but Danzo and the shinobi side were concerned. Konoha's Jinchuriki, as Danzo liked to call Naruto, wasn't in Konoha. They didn't even know where he was, except for a few rumors of an orange blur headed in the direction of Wave Country, but that was over three years ago. However, a new rumor on the orange-loving blonde was confirmed true by one of Jiraiya's spies. Right now, if one were to look inside the Kanoha mission room, they would see a group of people being addressed by the Hokage and her advisors. There were nine people in total being addressed, all ranked Chunin or above. Starting from left to right, there was a girl with her hair up in Chinese-style buns. She had steel-gray eyes and wore a long-sleeved white blouse with a high collar and red fastener, puffy pants that looked like a hakama, with the exposed parts of her legs near the waist covered in bandages, and on her back was a large scroll. Next to her was a man who wore a green jumpsuit, orange leg warmers, a zipped-up dark green Kanoha flak jacket, bandages wrapped up around his hands, and a red belt with the Kanoha symbol around his waist. He had black bowl-cut hair and thick eyebrows. To his right was a fair-skinned man with long dark brown hair and white pupilless eyes. He wore a white robe with loose sleeves, a dark navy gray apron tied around his waist, and black shinobi sandals. Next to him was a brown-eyed man with spiky hair similar to that of a pineapple. He wore a flak jacket along with a long-sleeved black shirt and pants. On the left sleeve of his shirt was a metal plate with the Kanoha symbol etched on it. To his right was a man with a robust physique, long spiky brown hair, and black eyes. He wore a red suit with armor with a flak jacket on top. He also wore a red Kanoha headband on top of his head. Next to him was a girl with light blue eyes and blonde hair that was tied up in a high ponytail with one flattened bang covering her right eye. She wore a short purple sleeveless blouse along with an open front purple apron skirt over a black skirt and short fishnet shorts. Next to her was a figure clad in a leather form-fitting black jacket, black pants, shinobi sandals, and a headband. With him was a large white fur dog that was the size of a small horse. To the right of the dog was a girl with dark blue waist-length hair, fair skin, and white pupilless eyes. Her outfit consisted of a long-sleeved zip-up lavender and cream jacket, navy blue pants, and low-heeled sandals. Finally, at the end was a tall man wearing black glasses and a knee-length jacket with a hood covering most of his face. The nine shinobi were nine of what was known as the Rookie Eleven, Tintin, Lee, Niji, Shikamaru, Chuji, Ino, Kiba, and Akamaru, Hinata, and Shino. You have all been called here for an S-rank retrieval mission, Tsunade said, addressing the nine shinobi in front of her. S-rank retrieval mission? Kiba asked. Who would be so hard to retrieve that the mission is S-rank? You know who, we all do, Tsunade replied, causing the nine to either gasp in surprise, have their eyes widen, or both. There was one person they all knew to be missing. Naruto, Hinata gasped. Her former crush had disappeared over three years ago and had not been heard of since. Considering how Naruto was, everyone found it odd. Many had feared he was killed or worse, captured by the Akatsuki. Yes, Danzo, one of the Hokage's advisors, replied. According to Jiraiya-san's spy network, the Akatsuki are making their move in capturing the Jinchuriki. Your mission is to find and escort Naruto back to Kanoha. Failure is not an option, Tsunade finished in a serious tone. In addition to your retrieval team, you will be accompanied by two of my best men, Danzo added. Yamado and Sai. What? Why should we even bring your root Unbu along with us? Kiba exclaimed outraged. Yamato has the ability of the Shodame Hokage, first Hokage, Mokuton, would release. And Sai has the ability of the Bokuton, ink release. Both are very adept in their abilities, Danzo explained, his eyes slightly narrowing. Focus, Tsunade said. From what we've discovered, Naruto went in the direction of Wave Country. You'll start your search from there and so on. Good luck. And bring back Naruto. Hi, Hokage-sama, was said by the Nine as they walked out of the room. Hokage-sama, might I ask why you didn't send the other members of Team 7 as well? Danzo asked. You and I both know that they'd charge straight on if they found out it was Naruto. At least the rest of the Rookie Eleven would retain their common sense, Tsunade replied. I see, Danzo said. I hope you're fine, Naruto, wherever you are, Tsunade thought. Naruto's dream world, time. Unknown, Naruto's P.O.V. I had just fallen asleep after finding where the orientation was and just in time to hear Ashbin's speech towards this year's freshman. 
We were then told that we would all rest in the room we were currently in, and so, I fell asleep as usual. Only this time, I didn't have the same dreams I usually had. No, this wasn't my usual dream where a giant bowl of ramen did the Karameldensen. In front of me was pitch black. Nothing else other than glowing crystals of all colors and two fireballs that were blue and red. Suddenly, lightning struck out of nowhere, flashing every now and then, revealing certain images that I couldn't comprehend. The images I saw, though I couldn't clearly see what was happening, were of two small white blurs, one surrounded by a rainbow of colors, the other by red and blue. And above them was a giant red eye. It was the only thing I could see clearly. It had four rings that went from the center pupil along with nine tomo. When I stared at it, I was filled with fear as if I was looking at something worse than death. Suddenly, the one red eye turned into two purple eyes with four rings in each and no tomo. Unlike the one red eye, which was filled with rage, these eyes felt calm. You will face many trials, young one, a mysterious deep male voice said, but above all, you must break the cycle. And with that, my dream got even weirder. Beacon Academy, 7.42 AM, Naruto's P.O.V. I woke up from my strange dream, feeling refreshed for the rest of the day. Blinking a few times, I saw that an enthusiastic orange-haired girl was talking with a guy who had a highlight of magenta in his hair. I stretched out a bit, my fox ears and tail slightly twitching. Today was initiation. Many people were wondering who they'll be teamed with. Me, I wasn't worried at all. Hopefully, I would be teamed up with Ruby or Yang or some other nice people and not some arrogant jerks. I already dealt with Sasuke. I don't need to deal with a Sasuke 2.0. I packed a sleeping bag that everyone was given for the first night, ate the cafeteria pancakes for breakfast, and brushed my teeth. All the while, that cheerful orange-haired girl was talking to the guy with the magenta highlight. That all took about an hour to do. I didn't have to go to the weapons locker room, considering I had my weapons sealed onto my personnel. How did you get your weapons? I didn't see you go to the weapons locker room. John asked me as we walked to the designated area Professor Oshbin told all freshmen to go to. Trade secret, I said, slightly smirking. Emerald Forest Cliffside, 9.10 a.m. For years, you have trained to become warriors, and today, your abilities will be evaluated in the Emerald Forest, Ashbin stated. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard rumors about the assignment of teams. Well, allow us to put an end to your confusion. Each of you will be given teammates, today, Glinda added. What? Oh. I heard Ruby murmur in concern. These teammates will be with you for the rest of your time here at Beacon. So it is in your best interest to be paired with someone with whom you can work well, Ashpin said. Hearing this Ruby groaned as did a few others. That being said, the first person you make eye contact with after landing will be your partner for the next four years. What? Ruby exclaimed in panic. See? I told you. The orange-haired girl started. Ashpin had cut her off before she could continue speaking. After you've been partnered up, make your way to the northern end of the forest. You will meet opposition along the way. Do not hesitate to destroy everything in your path, or you will die. This caused John to laugh nervously before gulping loudly. You will be monitored and graded through the duration of your initiation, but our instructors will not intervene. You will find an abandoned temple at the end of the path containing several relics. Each pair must choose one and return to the top of the cliff. You will guard that item, as well as your standing, and grade you appropriately. Are there any questions? Yeah, um, sir. John asked hesitantly, raising his hand. Good. Now, take your positions. Ashpin said. I looked at my surroundings, seeing near the left end of the line we were all in was the girl with mint green hair I saw earlier. Next to her was the monkey faunus and the horse faunus. Then there was the black-haired girl with a katana on her back and a bow in her hair, the white-haired girl with a rapier, the red-haired girl holding a spear, a guy with a light green mohawk, the cheerful orange-haired girl with a grenade launcher on her back. The guy with the magenta highlights was holding green pistol knives in his hands, an arrogant light brown-haired man in armor, Yang, Ruby, John, and finally at the end was me. Everyone was getting in their fighting stances, except for John who still had his hand raised. Soon enough, the mechanical platforms we were on started ejecting people into the forest, starting with the left. Uh, sir? I've got, um, a question, John asks, not noticing that the number of students being ejected was increasing. So, this landing... Strategy thing? Uh, well, what is it? You're, like, dropping us off or something? No. You will be falling, Ashpin answered. Oh, uh, I see. So did you, like, hand out parachutes for us? Jean asked as more students were thrown into the forest. No. You will be using your own landing strategy? 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Whilst John was still talking, the orange-haired girl and the guy with the magenta highlight were launched into the forest. Woo-ho! I heard Young exclaim as she was launched into the air, followed by Ruby. So, what exactly is a landing strateg, why? John exclaimed as he was launched into the air. I looked ahead as I prepared myself for the launching. A smirk appeared on my face as I was launched. Let's do this, Dateb. I exclaimed as I was finally launched. As I was in midair, I was able to see Professor Ashbin standing there, watching us being launched whilst drinking his coffee. Unknown location, 3rd P.O.V. Kakazu, you and Haydn will go after the Nibijin Churiki. Sasori, you and Daidara will go after the Achibijin Churiki. And finally, Itachi, you and Kisame will go to the land beyond the Okino Okinote and retrieve the Kubijin Churiki. Understood. A mysterious figure said. What stood out about this silhouette was the purple gray eyes that had four rings in them. Hi, Leader Sama, was the chorus of responses. One by one, the group of mysterious figures disappeared until there were four left. The one with the purple gray eyes turned to one of the few remaining people left. And you're sure that the Kyubi Jinchuriki is beyond the Okino Okinote? The figure asked. Are you questioning the extent of my knowledge? The other mysterious figure threatened more than asked. No, but I'm curious as to how you know of this land beyond the Okino Okinote. Humph, I've seen many things in my lifetime. Nagato, is that all? Yes, Madara-sama. Good. And with that, two more of the mysterious figure disappeared leaving only two. You know he can't be trusted, Nagato. I know, Conan, but we have to for now. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.